Hello, everyone, and welcome back to In the Spotlight. I have a wonderful story for you guys today. I uh, have the lovely provost of NYU on air with us today, Catherine Fleming. Dr. Fleming is also a historian, and uh, Dr. Catherine Fleming has teamed up with journalist Sofia Papayoanu, and they have created a wonderful uh, website called historima.org. It is a non-for-profit which compiles these amazing stories of Greeks from all walks of life in Greece and not only, as well as the homogenia. And historima.gr is, uh, .org rather, is taking Greece and the world by storm. And I like to, to call Catherine, uh, a, I pinned her the Lord Byron of Greece. She is a female Lord Byron. She is, she must have been a Greek in a past life. Dr. Fleming, welcome to our show in the spotlight. Thank you so much, Yana. I'm thrilled to be here with you. You have uh, done some amazing work here. Uh, I understand this is a project that's, that's been very dear to you for many years. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, how this concept was uh, you know, inspired and, and the steps it took to, to get realized? Absolutely. So the concept of this oral history project really arose out of a series of kind of casual conversations I had with Sofia Papayoanu, who's a very good friend of mine, uh, we bonded early over our shared love of sort of, I guess, human interest stories and the unknown histories of, uh, of far-flung Greece. And we decided that rather than just keep talking about how much we loved stories, that we would try and figure out a way to go and gather them. And we spoke with the Stavros New Yorkers Foundation uh, to see if there was a way that they might be interested in helping us uh, actualize the project. And they had a brilliant idea, which was to make it part of their Recharging the Youth initiative, which tries to uh, attach young Greeks more to their homeland, prevent brain drain, and provide meaningful employment wherever possible to young Greeks. So it made the project huge because we're employing 1,500 young Greeks but made it even more meaningful. This is absolutely amazing. Um, and I'm so excited that this is live and happening. And you have also uh, brought together a lot of great field reporters from around Greece that are telling the stories and it's brilliant. And you're telling these oral histories in a very unique way, very uh, exciting. Uh, there are interviews that are also they're, they're written and they're also in a podcast and you have a lot of wonderful videos. Tell us about that. So yeah, so the project really is three different things at once. Uh, first, it's a jobs creation project. So as you say, we have these field reporters all over Greece. Uh, this is the 1500 young unemployed Greeks I referred to. We train them in the ethics and practice of oral history in interview technique and uh, also on the technical sides of using recording equipment, they each get a Zoom recorder. So that's one big component of the project. A second big component is this website, historima.org, where we curate selected stories, turn them into podcasts, have some of them, as you say, in written forms. A very few of them are available in video form. We're really trying to introduce the Greek public to the genre of podcast through this site. It's something that we're pretty familiar with here uh, in the United States, but is it's less known in Greece. So you can click on it. You know, you've had that experience maybe of sitting on a bus or sitting on a train or being in a public space and you don't mean to, but you're eavesdropping on the people next to you and someone is telling someone a fabulous and fascinating story of their life. We sort of want it to feel a little bit like that. You can click on a story and you can hear um, someone's very direct reminiscence uh, or account of something they've lived through. And then the third component of the project is a huge archive, uh, really a research archive, a born digital research archive that will ultimately have over 50,000 stories in it. Not all of which, of course, are going to be turned into podcasts, but all of which will be available to researchers uh, with all sorts of sorts of metadata and tagging so that people can find the kinds of things they're interested in. Well, this is exciting. It's innovative and it's brilliant. Uh, a podcast, it's, it's great. You're right, Greece is not used to the podcast. You're introducing it. You are employing Greeks. They're very talented. Tell me a little bit about your experience and the development of it and, and what were some of the hurdles or what, what were some of the 
um, refreshing things that you weren't expecting? Well, uh, you know, the big hurdle, obviously, is the scope of the project. It's just massive. And if you think about it all as one piece, you get intimidated very early. Uh, you know, the idea of having 1,500 people all around the country um, whom you're in some, some sense responsible for is very daunting. Uh, the numbers I've thrown around are very, very big. But the, the features of it that I guess we hadn't really anticipated being so rewarding uh, connect to both how the interview subjects and also the interviewers feel about the experience of the conversation that they have with one another. We're struck by the number of interview subjects who at the end of an interview say, thank you, thank you so much, thank you for talking to me, for asking me about my life, for giving me this, this chance to tell you about things I've experienced. We've also been struck by how many of our interview subjects start out by saying, I don't know why you'd wanna to talk to me. I don't really have anything to say. And then they come out with some absolutely incredible um, account of something that they've, they've lived through. Um, and then similarly for the field reporters, the young Greeks going out and collecting these stories, we've really been struck by how meaningful an experience it is for them to actually sit down in many instances with people who are significantly older than they are and, uh, and to ask them about their lives. And they report to us that they feel much more connected and kind of humanized by, by the experience. And I think weirdly, the thing we thought was gonna be most challenging, namely launching this during COVID, um, has proven to be one of the most sort of value added features of the project is that in this moment, when we all feel kind of isolated, it's a project that is designed to bring people closer together. It is, it is, absolutely. Um, what are some of the categories that you'd like to share with us so people can get an idea of what kind of stories you're looking for or what, what, what stories might interest uh, you guys? So we're really interested in anything. Um, and as many of our subjects say, they, you know, I don't have a story and then it turns out they do have a story. We have broad historical categories um, connected to Greek history, the survivors of which are now very old. So we have, you know, features of German occupation, the Italian occupation, civil war, military dictatorship, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But then of course, stories fall into more than one category. We also have people, we have a very moving account of someone telling us his experience um, as, uh, as a gay man and uh, the very painful experience of coming out to his family. We have accounts of Greek sailors who have been uh, crew members on ships uh, that have been hijacked off the coast of Nigeria. Uh, you know, th things that are definitely part of history but that don't fall into a specific era of history or a specific historical category. So on our site, we have things divided up. You know, we have traditions. Um, we, we have a category that is called history, which is kind of ridiculous since all of it is history. Um, and village life, agrarian life, love stories. Um, uh, Xenitia, people who've lived overseas, the experience of emigration or immigration or migration. Uh, but again, every story has many different tags and belongs in many different categories. It's absolutely amazing. I dove into it. I couldn't stop. I spent like all, over an hour. I couldn't get off the stories. Um, and it is an infectious. It's really amazing. And what I, I particularly happen to like were the, war, the stories during the war. I like the society story. I like them all, but I, I like history myself. So I found that you can, you know, you're actually archiving a lot of information about what was going on within society during the time of war. Uh, and, 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 the, and, the, and the different periods. Um, so that's why this is very valuable, I believe, for the future. Uh, it is a wonderful initiative. Congratulations. Um, what would you like to tell the viewers out there about historima.org? Well, I, I'd like people to know that history may not be what they think it is. It isn't just something that uh, happens to important people like, uh, you know, politicians, if we think they're important, which some of us don't. 
it isn't just, you know, names that you've heard of or dates in a book. It's something that everybody has lived through and participated in. And, uh, and this is a very, very important way to think about one's own experience, as well as about the value of learning about the experience of others. Catherine, how can someone help support uh, your, uh, your NGO? What can they do? I mean, on any level, whether it be volunteer or donations, how can, or partnerships, wh where, who can they contact and, and how can they help? Thank you very much. Well, of course, they can always contact me. Uh, but uh, on our site at istorima.org, there is the opportunity if people want to make a, a financial donation, they will have the opportunity to do that. But really, the thing we're most interested in is, is great stories. So if people have a family member or a friend or someone whom they know to have experienced something uh, meaningful and worth worth sharing we want to know about it and they can they can write to us again they can connect via the website and uh give us good leads and uh we'd be very grateful for the opportunity to go out and talk to those people give us your three most favorite stories i know you have many but what which three jump at you and have touched your heart really so i have to say um we have a uh, a wonderful cretan man from anoya who has spent his entire life uh, telling Matinades and dancing, uh, Matinades of his own creation. And uh, he, he is just remarkable. And he talks about sort of the, the, the life-giving force of, of, of beautiful poems. And he has a phenomenal line in which he talks about how he's never picked up a gun in his life, which if you know anything about Cretan men is a rarity. He <laughs> says, I've never picked up a gun in my life. My bullets are matinades because a gun doesn't give life. It takes it away. Uh, so, so that is one that, that definitely uh, stands out for me uh, in a really big way. Um, there also is a young woman who tells a, a, a kind of very everyday story of something that clearly was not at all every day in her life, uh, the account of a car accident that she was in with her sister. Um, and she really recounts what goes through her mind in the flashing split seconds right before what she thinks is gonna be her death, right before the point of impact and in those flashing moments, she realizes that if she wants to become an actress, which is what she's always dreamed of, she better get her act together and do it. And after the accident, which thank God she survives, uh, she, she goes on and actually does become an actress. So it's a great story, just sort of about, um, you know, doing the things we wanna do and what it is that motivates us to do them. We also have an uh, amazing story from Mr. Guarmezano, who is a Greek Jew who survived uh, what would have been sure death uh, with deportation by the Germans during World War II in hiding in a house in Psychico, just north of Athens. And his life is completely confined to a crawl space that he hides in. But for certain hours of the day, he can sneak out onto a balcony if he's lying down and he chooses to plant some bean plants uh, on the balcony because beans grow so quickly. And as he explains it, he, he wanted desperately to see life in the midst of this moment. Um, and that's a remarkable story that, uh, you know, is about history. It's about World War II, but it isn't about, you know, battalions and troop movements. It's about the war as experienced by one individual uh, and sort of the allegory of the, of the bean plant. And it makes us connect so much more easily to that history, I think, than, than a history book might. Wonderful stories, heartwarming, emotional, and unforgettable. Uh, and again, congratulations. I want to go back to you now for a second. You are uh, the Lord Byron, as I say, the, <laughs> the modern... <laughs> I, I hope uh, not always. <laughs> you're an you're an honorary Greek. Come on, um, you even speak Greek, which I'm very proud of. And when I hear a lot of my Greek, uh, you know, first second generation Greek friends that can't speak the language, I go dropi, because <laughs> I have I have a friend who 
well, knocks it out of the ballpark with her Greek, and she's not even of Greek descent. Uh, so, and, and she's making us all proud. And so I'd love to talk about you and where your love affair with Greece began. So uh, it just the completely random circumstances of life. Uh, I had no a priori knowledge of or even particular interest in Greece. I was an undergraduate. I went to Barnard College uh, in uptown Manhattan and did a semester abroad in England And uh, despite the fact that I'm half English, I was still really taken aback by how cold the British winter was. That year was a particularly bad, bad winter. Uh, And so in about February, it must have been of 80, 85, I think it was 1985, a friend of mine and I said, look, we got to get out of here. We had a a three week break before um, spring exam period. And we got a year rail pass and we went to the most distant point that you were allowed to go to that was valid with a year rail pass. And that was Athens. Uh, (laughs) And we landed up in Athens. You know, I think we spent an afternoon looking at a book or maybe on the flight uh, over to Greece, you flew one way and then took the train back the other, tried to figure out how to say yes and no. Of course we got that wrong since uh, yes sounds like no in English. And we were too stupid to, uh, (laughs) to figure that out quickly. Um, and, you know, after tromping around a bit, trying to figure out what we were doing, we landed up in a beautiful little village on the southwest coast of Crete, a town called Lutro in Chores Vakion. Um, and at the time, the village was just starting to have a real tourist presence. There were very few rooms for rent. Uh, there were two restaurants. And one of the restaurants was operated by a family that had recently returned from Cleveland, Ohio, where the father had been a house painter. And we ate at that restaurant every night because we were staying at the rooms at the other restaurant. So to kind of spread our business around town, we rented rooms from one establishment and then we had our dinners at the other. And toward the end of our stay, the guy kind of jokingly said, you know, I'm going to need a, a waitress who speaks English. And I said, well, I speak English really well. And on a complete whim, I said to him, look, I'm going to go back to London. I'll take my exams and uh, I'll, you know, I'll be back in about five, six weeks and I'll be your waitress. Um, Which is what I did. I of course had no idea what I was getting into. I have never worked so hard in my life. Uh, I remember saying to him, you know, so, you know, when's my day off? And uh, this must have been early June. He said, well, the boat leaves. The boat was the only way to get to town. The, the last boat leaves on October 31st. So your day, <laughs> off, your day off is November 1st. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, you spent the whole summer instead of on the beach in the restaurant. <laughs> oh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I worked extremely, extremely hard. If you need your toilet scrubbed, if you need something cleaned, uh, I'm, I'm your person. I know how to do it all really well. And, uh, it was their phenomenal family. Uh, the Andrew Lakakis family, I'm still in close touch with them. Uh, are they a story? Are they a story on your site? Uh, they, they, for sure. Okay. They're not on the site yet, but they will be. Okay, good, good. Yeah. So that was that- my first, my first encounter with Greece. And then it kind of went from there and became far more formalized over the years. Tell us a little bit about your, uh, you know, where you are today and um, some thoughts about where education is going and how you see education in Europe and Greece in particular with uh, with all, you know, with everything that's happening, the opportunities that a lot of the students have or don't have. You know, I I hold a a leadership position in American higher education, and uh, we see that there is still a tremendous desire on the part of international students to come to the United States to study to, for their university degrees. And I think the main reason for that uh, is that we still offer a kind of critical thinking approach, blue sky approach to education that is not present in Europe and certainly isn't present in Greece. You, you go into university in Greece knowing exactly what you wanna study um, and don't have a lot of time to sort of try out a little of this and a little of that. And for someone who's in the humanities as a historian, 
it's, it's a shame because a lot of people come to disciplines such as mine, uh, not really knowing what it's all about, take a course or two and then discover that they have a passion for it. And uh, while that's possible in the American system, it happens far less frequently in, in the European systems in general. Absolutely. Um, and there's a lot of talented and, 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 and very, very uh, bright uh, Greek students uh, that uh, wish to come to the States and study. And you do a lot to help them. Congratulations on that as well. Uh, Dr. Fleming, thank you so much for your time and sharing your wonderful uh, stories with us and your wonderful project. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, istorima.org. Uh, you'll see it right there underneath with uh, the graphic. Anything uh, that you want to share with Greece and the world, get in there, share your stories, get in touch. Also, help and donate these type of initiatives. They're so necessary to keep preserving the histories, the stories, the people, the culture, and also the bridge that connects us to the rest of the world. Uh, congratulations to you and uh, Mrs. Papayuanu, Miss Papayuanu, Sophia. You're doing a great job. We're going we're gonna to catch up with you guys later on and see what the more that you guys grow. And um, thank you for being a guest on our show. Thanks so much. My pleasure. And, uh, and also, I got to say thank you to the New York House Foundation for taking a risk on funky projects like this one and, uh, and making it happen. The New York House Foundation always has been a pillar for the uh, Greek, uh, Greek uh, for Hellenism, rather. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Fleming. Thank you. Thank Take you. Take care. Uh, lovely to talk to you. Bye. Bye.